Right now it's busy time, exam time. So people are having some of their, some of the students are still in the, in the middle of their exam procedure. So that's why mm -hmm. it's taking a little bit slow to join, but this topic sure. is immensely interesting to everyone. Our colleagues as well, mm -hmm. they are likely to be with us soon. I've been copying the link. People are asking, not everyone has been able to register. Just a moment. With your kind permission, do you think I should start? Yes, please. Please do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are very privileged, dear Karazin, the Til Karazin Kharkiv academic uh, community, our dear university friends, our dear guests, our dear visitor, guest lecturer, and our presenter for today. We are deeply honored to have you with us. It's a big privilege. And as we know, bright people are especially clearly seen in the times of darkness. So thank you very much for being the one who came to support our community and our university today. The university that has not relocated and is shaping its way towards victory in Kharkiv under severe shelling. And I would like to express my deep gratitude to the uh, people who make this project technically possible, to our public relations center and to the representatives of our dear rectorate. I would like to represent our dear guest, an IT entrepreneur, a columnist, dear Professor Kai Arno. During the meeting, our dear guest will be talking about his project that is supported by the Silkaraz and Kharkiv National University, which is aiming at correcting the distorted mirror of the layer of propaganda information uh, about Ukrainian history posted on Wikipedia. Our dear guest, is a former vice president of the MYCQL community at MYCQLAB, Sun Microsystems and Oracle Corporations, founder of MariaDB Corporation app and current CEO of the MariaDB Foundation. Our dear guest studied physics at Helsinki University of Technology. And I'm very happy to announce our today's event, the 19th within the initiative a lecture to victory, speakers of the world in support of Vasil Karazin, Kharkiv National University. And I'm very happy to greet our guest and to express my deep gratitude to Professor Peshkova, Olga Gennadievna, my dear friend and colleague with whose kind help we were able to get in touch with our dear guest and who kindly helped during the whole process of organizing this beautiful event, I would like to step down in favor of Olga Gennadievna, the grant manager of International Relations Office, senior lecturer of Mikola Lukas Translation Studies Department of the Silka Razin Kharkiv National University, the person whose courage I simply admire. Thank you so much, Olga Gennadievna. The floor is yours. I'm very happy to step down in your favor. Would you please greet our dear guests?
Thank you so uh, thank much. You. Thank you very much, Elena Victor. Elena Victor is my university lecturer, and uh, most probably I was not a bad student. Uh, that's why. Uh, 11 you were years, brilliant. 11 years, years later, <laughs> she, she uh, still continues to praise me. But uh, basically, my uh, it is my honor, definitely. It is not just a word, but uh, really the truth. It is my honor to introduce Kai. Kai is one of the most enthusiastic people I have ever known. And I'm sure, basically, I, I, uh, there are not many things which I'm sure of, but this is one of them, that he is one of the most enthusiastic people I will ever know in my life in the future. Uh, and I'm uh, absolutely sure that uh, due to such people, precisely due to such people, the world continues to improve, the world continues to go on and so on. The topic of uh, his activities and the activities of his colleagues is uh, definitely important. Uh, we may have different attitudes to Wikipedia in general, we may just use it regularly or use it from time to time, but uh, I think that uh, the vast majority of us will agree that we do use it and um, do rely on the facts, uh, or at least we take into account the facts which uh, we uh, may find in Wikipedia. So the uh, task of uh, getting rid of uh, Russian propaganda and Russian influence in all the spheres of our life, including the informational sphere, is uh, definitely crucial nowadays. So the topic is uh, uh, absolutely important. Uh, Kai is absolutely brilliant. Uh, so I hope uh, and I'm sure that everybody will uh, enjoy his speech. Kai, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, speak to us, and you are very welcome. Well, thank you, thank um, you so much. For those truly eloquent uh, introductions. I'm I'm deeply grateful and honored to be part of, of of this project, and for you to have invited me to to talk about uh, something that is dearly close to my heart. And I'll start with the emotional reason why this is important for me. It's uh, my son, Felix Rurik Ademar Ademarovich Arne. He is half Ukrainian and half uh, Finnish, Finland, Swedish. And, and I want him to grow up in a place where, where his ancestry is being correctly represented in the West and throughout the world. So that's my emotional reason why I devote energy uh, to this. So I was already introduced when it comes to my, my background. I'll just repeat as a, a, a highlight that uh, one of the reasons why we have started this project is based on the um, career that I've had at a database company called MySQL which is now owned by Oracle. It was sold to Sun Microsystems uh, for, for something that is called a unicorn for a billion dollars in 2009. And I was involved from the very beginning within that, that company in the leadership team. And since uh, that database was being used not only in Facebook and all of the LinkedIn's and, and uh, big, big uh, websites in general, it, uh, it was also used within Wikimedia. Uh, that is why I've been exposed to uh, open data from the very beginning. Now, since then, since 2009, when, when uh, MySQL was bought by Oracle, uh, by uh, Sun Microsystems and later on Oracle, uh, things have changed and the new database upon which it's based is called MariaDB. And that is uh, the place where uh, uh, I'm still involved uh, in my daytime job as the CEO of the MariaDB Foundation. I'm also a uh, founder, one of the co-founders of MariaDB Corporation. And now uh, Wikimedia runs on this very database and I'm going to have a meeting with uh, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation uh, tomorrow about our detailed level of, of cooperation. And I'm also, uh, based on all of this, uh, a board member at Wikimedia uh, Finland. So, so clo close tie with, uh, with uh, and the Wikimedia community. So the topic at hand here is, uh, could be expressed also in other words. One such expression would be decolonization of Ukrainian history 
in Wikipedia. So uh, it might be that uh, the Ukraine, uh, as, uh, that Ukraine as a, as a country was uh, theoretically decolonized uh, um, when, when things started moving after the, the Soviet Union. But that doesn't mean that in people's minds in the West that it would be decolonized. Of course, the general education about the level of understanding of, of what Ukraine is has grown immensely uh, since the 24th of February last year, and people have been educated. But when they are looking for historical background, they turn to Wikipedia, which in theory is neutral and good, but it's still based on information that uh, is outdated and that is based on, on Russian propaganda from the last, I would say, 300 years. And uh, how to uh, fix this, I think Wikipedia is the starting point. So when people in uh, our country, in Finland and in my previous country, Germany, and I would say all, all over the place in the West, when they don't know about something, uh, they turn to Wikipedia. If, if you are an educated person, the basis for your general, extending your general education is Wikipedia. In the very narrow field of your own specialty, like for me in databases, I don't turn to Wikipedia. I, I know my exact sources. I know exactly which literature to, to, to go to if I want to have a specific question answered. Uh, so sometimes I get an overview in Wikipedia, but I know the exact sources. But that's only in the very, very narrow area of my specialty. Once I go to some other topic, anything general, the first source and perhaps the only source of information that I look into is Wikipedia. And that is the general pattern which we see. So <clears throat> to start off, uh, the most credible source of information for the educated general public, for the journalists, for the politicians, for basically anybody, is uh, Wikipedia. Uh, there is a misconception still in some places that, oh, well, we are so educated that we don't use Wikipedia. And this is a prevalent uh, prejudice, particularly in, in um, universities and in the uh, humanities, that uh, many people consider themselves too smart or too fine or too educated to confess that they use Wikipedia. But uh, uh, that has changed a couple of years ago in the West. So the more universities we are talking to in Finland, in Germany, in Sweden and in other places, they do say that uh, they start from Wikipedia uh, even if they are at a university level. And uh, another point which is truly important to understand is that people, the general public, are using Wikipedia in their own language. Uh, I happen to uh, enjoy reading not just in Swedish, which is my own language, but I do enjoy reading in German and in French and in English. So sometimes I, I have a, a, a staircase of escalation of reading about something. I start in Swedish, the article is usually short, I get the general picture. If I want more detail, I go to German, which I also read. And uh, then I, uh, I get sometimes the, a difference between how things are presented in Swedish and in German. And that's an advantage if you're using many languages. But most people are actually focusing only on their own language. Now, you in Kharkiv would probably be able to use three languages uh, as a source, Ukrainian, uh, Russian, English. And if you compare the same article in those languages, you will see that it's not the same story that is being told. And that is what we are trying uh, to fix here. 
Um, and the good, so we have done a similar project. So Robert Silen, who is here present with me in this um, presentation, we have started a project uh, which is called Frederica. And that's after a, a, the first a female journalist in Finland. And she's also the wife of our Taras Shevchenko. Our uh, Taras Shevchenko is called Johan Ludwig Runeberg. He was born 10 years before uh, Taras and Shevchenko and died 10 years later, but basically a, a contemporary of Taras. And uh, we chose that, uh, this lady as our uh, namesake for, for our uh, project. Uh, and uh, the, the idea being that she is a symbol of education, a symbol of, of uh, having a basic understanding of how uh, the world uh, works. And the topic of Project Frederica is, is a somewhat more peaceful uh, situation than, than the war that we see going on uh, to the horror of everybody in, in Europe. It is about Swedish Finland. So you might not be aware, but much like Switzerland or Belgium, Finland is a country with several languages. So we have uh, Finnish as one national language and Swedish as another national language. And sometimes the information about Swedish Finland is missing, is lacking, or is not representative. And that is what we set out to fix. And that is uh, what we have been fixing for the past three, four years and achieved great success in uh, getting it to be portrayed in a correct way in Swedish and other languages, in Swedish, Finnish, English, German, and a number of other languages. We've done edits in a total of 40 languages about, about Finland. And this uh, has had a good impact on having the right uh, people presented as being Finland Swedes uh, and not just being generic Finns, which then led us to, now that we, we, we have the war going on, uh, to the thought that we need to fix a much, much bigger problem, which is acute, urgent for the entire world, which is that people do not know the basic facts about Ukraine. And, and uh, that is how we decided to start uh, Project Katerina. And Katerina, the name there, we picked it because uh, there are plenty of man names anywhere out there. So we let us continue with the tradition from, from Frederica. And, and of course, this is the painting by Taras, uh, Taras Shevchenko, which is why we picked the name um, Federica uh, uh, Katerina. So uh, let me now go to a presentation that, that we've prepared. So this was sort of the, the, the starting point. And one thing that I want to underline from the very beginning is that if you find this interesting and if you find this important, please uh, contact us. Uh, we are, you can contact us uh, under our emails, but I think the best way for you to interact is likely over uh, a telegram. And uh, uh, my wife, Lena, uh, you can approach her as Lena. L-E-N-A underscore R-N-O or A-R-N-O uh, over, uh, over Telegram. So that's the best way to, 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 to contact us. Now I wonder if I can share my screen here. Let's see. Yes, it seems like it's doable. So I will do that here. I'm, uh, can I have somebody say whether, whether you see my screen now? Absolutely. Thank you. Excellent. So, um, Project Katerina, uh, yeah, by the way, we, we use this fun spelling here uh, for a reason. So project in English is, of course, spelled with a C. We spell it with a K, and uh, that's because most languages 
Swedish, German, and so on, use a K. And we want to make the point here that this is not about English Wikipedia. It is about English Wikipedia and a number of other Wikipedias. Uh, it's not sufficient to fix things in Ukrainian or Ukrainian and English. No, it has to be fixed in many, many languages. And, and in order to underline that, uh, it's, it's evident even from the name of the project here. Um, and it's about undoing uh, imper Russian imperialist propaganda. So here's, there's a lot of text here, but we're going into some detail here about how people form their opinion of what Ukraine is. And uh, here we have some questions that people ask themselves. And, and those questions are being asked based on public opinion of the last 300 years, or, or in particular, as we have been brainwashed by Putin's troll fa factories the last 20 years. So is there a Russian-Ukrainian war going on now, or is it a conflict between fraternal nations? And uh, the revolution of dignity, was it a revolution or was it a, a coup? And uh, we could go into details here. I mean, the world is full of details. We have to fix the main things first, but in order to see the magnitude of the problem, I'll go into, into details here. Is, uh, and now, sorry for my pronunciation, Karalyov probably, is he a great Russian designer or is he Ukrainian? A person, a painter, uh, Ilya Repin, who died in Finland. Yes, he died in Finland in Kuokkala, which is now occupied by Russia, but still that, that, that time at the time of Ilya Repin's death, it was Finland. Uh, was he a, a Ukrainian artist or a Russian artist? I was educated that he was a Russian artist, but that's because of Russian propaganda. It's not because of him inherently being a Russian artist. And then what about Holodomor? Was the famine of 30 years of the 30s, was it an artificially provoked famine or was it natural and it affected many parts of the Soviet Union? And if you look at these uh, articles, it, the answers are not clear. It, it, you will get a very, very distorted answer to these questions. A person which, which uh, has some bearing for Robert and me, Mazepa, uh, he was, uh, we were part of, Finland was part of Sweden, or just one normal part of Sweden in, in uh, 300 years ago. So in, in the Battle of Poltava, uh, I was educated at school that, that it was us against Russia. It was we, we Sweden against them Russia. Uh, very much later, I realized that no, there was somebody called Mazepa who, who, who fought with us. And uh, the next thing I thought uh, that, that, that I heard was that, okay, yeah, this was somebody who betrayed uh, the rest of the Russians um, uh, and, and, and fought with us for some whatever opportunistic reason. That's the first picture when I ever heard about him that I got. And obviously that's wrong. If you, you, you might uh, be better off saying that, that we were supporting uh, Ukrainian uh, independence uh, towards, towards Russia. That, that, that's another possible view of things if you want to be neutral. So Mazepa might have wanted a better future for his native land and saw uh, uh, Charles the, the 12th of Sweden as an ally against uh, 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 Pieter Pervoje. And, and of course, the most trivial things, does the Ukrainian language exist or is it a, a dialect of Russian? So now I've been exposed to it enough to understand that Ukrainian is more related to Polish uh, than it is to, to Russian. Yes, uh, Kirillits are true, but th those things would not be known facts. Like I've, I've, I sat in a sauna yesterday in Finland uh, speaking with some people from Portugal who, who were here on business. And we spoke about Ukraine and, and something about language uh, be, because they, they were sp speaking Italian and Portuguese. And I said that, well, did you know that Ukrainian is more related to, to Polish than it is to, to, to Russian? And they had no clue whatsoever. They were curious and they were interested, but they have been educated 
in a world where it's sort of a dialect and it doesn't really matter. Uh, why, why bother? It's just a dialect of Russian. And uh, so does Ukraine have its own history as a state? Or is it is the Ukrainian history an invention by Ukrainian historians just to to uh, uh, fight uh, other uh, Slavic people such as uh, such as Russia? So the way to to fix this is a lot of work. So we need to fix this in in all the articles, or for those, uh, obviously the most important ones first, and in all the languages. Obviously, also there in the most important languages first. And here, let me make the point that it's not necessarily English first. It, it can very often be a neighboring country first, like Polish which is important, Swedish important, Finnish is important, uh, because we share a common history with you and hence a better understanding for diversity and for, for the complexities, for the intricacies of, of, of history. So, so um, we have here a couple of, of uh, screenshots about uh, La Révolution de la Dignité, Revolution of Dignity, and the Ukraine and Vallan uh, uh, which would be in, in French, English, and, and Finnish. So the Azov Brigade, you would have been surprised to see the amount of articles which uh, in, in various theoretically independent or even liberal, neutral uh, Western newspapers who, who think that Azov Brigade is, is a bunch of Nazis fighting. And uh, the, if you look then at the source for that information, it would be very often the Wikipedia articles. And the, uh, we here, here have some translations uh, from the German version uh, translated uh, over Google. And yeah, it is, it's, it's not as much as, uh, it's not as bad as being complete lies, but it is very often a question of just showing part of the truth. One of my examples um, often is the article about Ukrainian nationalism. So, okay, there's nationalism in any country. We, uh, in, in, in Finland, the article about uh, 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 Finnish nationalism is about the national awakening. And it's about this Johan Ludwig Runeberg and his colleagues at the same time as Taras Shevchenko. And it's a source of national pride and it's something good and it's, it's loaded with po positive words. It is when Finland was defined as an independent country uh, years before it truly got its independence from, from Russia. But the article about Ukrainian independence, or not independence, but Ukrainian nationalism in Swedish, well, it, it, the, the, the basic takeaway is that a lot of Jews were killed. Well, that might be true, but it's perhaps 4% uh, of the entire uh, reasoning behind Ukrainian uh, nationalism, uh, where, where uh, very few languages explain the Emsky Ukaz or, or the other happenings uh, uh, where Ukrainian culture was, was being, uh, the language was not being accepted, was being um, prohibited from usage and all of that. Uh, those things have just not been written there. And the good part about Wikipedia is that Wikipedia encourages a complete view of things. It's not like they would promote, they would, they, uh, Wikipedia is not a platform where you can agitate uh, Wikipedia is not a platform for propaganda, but uh, Wikipedia does acknowledge that the residual effects of former Russian propaganda might still exist in the text. So they are very, very open and welcoming as a community to get uh, these things, things um, fixed. So we are in a way doing, if we go through with this project, we are doing Wikipedia a favor it's not the other way around that Wikipedia is doing the uh, people of uh, Ukraine, the country of Ukraine, the uh, language of Ukrainian a favor. No, that's, that's a self-evident thing. They, they, it, it is the basic value of Wikipedia to give a neutral point of view. And if you talk about Mazepa, well, yes, there can be a, a, a section about Mazepa betraying Peter the first because that's what some people think he did. 
uh, but there also then is another equally big or bigger section uh, based on, on, on what the actual facts are uh, about uh, Mazepa's views related to uh, 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 guaranteeing a better future for, for, for his country. And there's historical evidence for this, which brings me to the topic of sources. So Wikipedia is not a place where you can write your own opinions. And it's not enough that you're writing facts. You have to uh, cite sources. So that is why Wikipedia converges towards very high quality, because it welcomes not just a neutral point of view, it requires sources. So I cannot just claim that Mazepa did something uh, or, or I cannot just write as a claim that Mazepa fought for Ukraine's independence from uh, Russia. No, that's actually a wrong wording. But there are exact wordings in academic literature. And by quoting that either from a book or a web, web page, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, allowed and encouraged uh, to, to write such a thing into, into the article. Yeah, and Mazepa was already uh, discussing here about uh, the German version here saying that, well, he just changed sides. Okay, it's like an unreliable guy. Uh, Mazepa seems to, to be jumping to conclusions, but if you then look at the, the Ukrainian version, uh, which is in this case the best uh, researched one, it's about the, a union with the Kingdom of Sweden. And, and the, the, there's a long description here of the process by which uh, Mazepa negotiated with uh, Charles the, the 12th, 12th and, and all of that, and, and what, uh, the, uh, how he based this upon the opinions of, of uh, his uh, subordinates and all of that. And none of that is being written into German. It has to be. So we have a distorted uh, reality that we need to, to uh, to correct and, and all of the points in this slide, I think I've already made. And uh, perhaps the, I would say that the reasoning here why we have such a problem is that at the time that Wikipedia was written, uh, the, the, the history in Western European books about Ukraine were written from a Russian perspective. So the sources of many Wikipedia articles in German, French, Swedish, and so on. Uh, they are translated from the Russian uh, article because the Ukrainian didn't exist or because the Ukrainian one is too complicated to understand because nobody, nobody understood Ukrainian or whatnot. Whatever the reasons are, it, the end outcome is that the uh, Russian version is the one that uh, is, is uh, being used as the base for the uh, Western European uh, articles. Uh, I have a, an explanation also for uh, the German general attitude about uh, Ukraine, what it was until the 24th of, of February last, last year. And, and uh, I think every single language in Europe has, has a different uh, reason for how they have come to the, the view that they have at this point in time. But let me use German as an example. So, so Germany, I think it's a great country when it comes to understanding how evil they were uh, in general you, uh, during 1933 to 45. And basically every sane German uh, citizen is ashamed of what, Russia, uh, what Germany did from 33 to 45. And, and then if you go into detail, then they are ashamed towards Jews because of, of uh, Holocaust and they are ashamed uh, towards Russians because of the siege of, of Leningrad. And, but then it ends there. They don't understand what they did in, in, in the Baltics. They don't really, they know that they were bad in Poland, but, but hey, Russia, that's the one where we were really bad. And Ukraine, well, it's sort of part of Russia anyway, so we don't know anything about that. And they, they uh, and that's, uh, I, I'd like to defend uh, the Germans by saying that, yes, it's good that they understand how bad they were uh, towards uh, the Jews, and it's good that they understand that they were bad against the Russians, but then they, they stopped thinking. They did not uh, 
the general public and not even the educated people in Germany up until the war started did not know that they, the Germans killed more Ukrainians as an absolute number during World War II than what they killed Russians. They do not know that. And they do not know that uh, both per capita and absolutely uh, Ukraine suffered more in uh, World War II. They do not know about Holodomor. And, and that is one of the reasons is that if, I, I, I would have some understanding from them, for, for them. They, they know that they were bad and they know that they did something bad with the Jews and they know that they did something bad with the Russians. And now I don't want to hear anything more. Uh, I know I was bad. They, they sort of cannot take it. They, they, they were, they, there was an absolute stop at the point of when they, they thought that they, they could digest it. Now they do understand that they need to understand a bit more. So they would also know a bit more about their behavior in, in, in uh, Poland and in, in, in the Baltics. And in, in actual fact, Germany did great for Finland. So they, they, we owe a lot to uh, uh, Nazi Germany in Finland as a, as a historical detail here, uh, because without them, we would have lost our independence uh, uh, to, to, to Russia. But that's also unknown in, in Germany because they don't go into this level of detail. And the, the way to fix this is by uh, changing the, the basic content of uh, the, the, the place that people use as their um, source of information, which is Wikipedia. So Russian disinformation, uh, I think I've, I've made all of this, these uh, points already. It's Russian imperialistic disinformation that has worked well for 300 years. And now, this isn't as if Russia would be a truly unique country. Yes, there, have been, there has been disinformation on behalf of, of Germany uh, in, in 1933 to 45, uh, of England, of France, of Belgium, of America. All of those countries have had disinformation. But the difference here is that uh, most of those countries, if not all, have looked themselves in the mirror. Like after losing a war, you, you start to think about why you lost it. So that's why Germany has gone the farthest, not far enough when it comes to Ukraine, but still the farthest in understanding uh, their disinformation. And, and uh, uh, England has lost, lost uh, India and all of their colonies. So they had to look themselves in the mirror. Colonies were lost in, in uh, France and Belgium as, as well, uh, based on wars, and they, they hence have had to uh, look up uh, or sort of re-evaluate uh, information. Such a thing never happened uh, with, uh, with Russia. So yes, Russia uh, somehow ceased to exist in a way when, when the Soviet Union was started, but that all made it a bit more difficult to understand what Russian imperialism is, because the Soviet uh, times, uh, uh, I've come to understand, were, were um, obscuring the, uh, the, the Russian imperialism, and it, it actually continued in uh, undiminished form. Uh, so the challenges uh, are there, but there is a solution, and that is uh, Wikipedia. So we here have some numbers here. We were thinking about the top 100 articles about Ukraine in nine languages. Uh, and uh, Robert has done a lot of statistics on this. They are being read over 360 million times per year. And that has to be multiplied by a large number because that is the source of articles in newspapers. That is the source of answers of Google questions when people don't even click on uh, the, the actual article. That is the core of uh, information in the open world. Yeah, and the rest of the points here I've made. So it's NPOV stands for neutral point of view. It, it's uh, um, the fact that you are, not, you are not supposed to write propaganda into Wikipedia and the Russian propaganda that exists there is because of historic reasons, as, as we, we said.
Yeah. So what needs to be done here is to check these articles and to correct them. And those are two different processes. One is to, to compare these articles. Uh, you can do it for the most important articles. You do need to do it manually. But if you're going extending these 100 articles into 1,000 articles, we can use AI. We can use artificial intelligence for this. We can have a, a chat GPT version to compare the articles in different languages and say and identify amongst the 1000 biggest articles, which are the ones where the uh, distortion is at its biggest. And that's something which we can program using using Python and using the, the modules that exist in Python for, uh, for AI. So the, the new chat GPT things are really good for us for, for doing this checking. So for, for finding the big problems, for correcting them, that's where we need you. That's where we need uh, universities. That's where we need people who really know stuff. That's where we need people who know the sources. And the sources preferably not just in Ukrainian uh, or, or Russian, but in English, in German and, and other, other uh, languages, which is why we need to cooperate with uh, universities world, worldwide. So again, two steps here. One is to find the bugs, find the problems, find the propaganda. And second one is to fix it. And uh, we see several different, uh, like four different types of people that we need to combine their efforts here. So one is Wikipedians themselves. So we're, we're uh, using somebody else's Wiki, uh, 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 encyclopedia, somebody else's book, somebody else's uh, existing resources, and that is Wikipedia. Yes, I am part of Wikipedia, uh, the Wikimedia Finland Foundation, and yes, I'm talking to lots of people in, in various countries, but, but we have to realize that Wikipedia is a community and there are editors, and if you make an edit into an article, somebody else can fix it uh, and, and uh, that means that we need to treat this community with respect or I think that the, the, the better way to put it is to become members of that community ourselves and play with the rules that these Wikipedians play. So they, they set the rules for how the dictionary is, is, is working. Uh, so that's category one out of four. Two, that's you, that's universities. So those are, uh, uh, the, the first two are the ones that contribute uh, resources of the mind, uh, resources in your case about expertise related to Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian history, Ukrainian politics, uh, various Ukrainian uh, phenomena and how they are uh, uh, documented in, in actual research that has to be used as, as sources. Uh, group three would be people who can finance this. So Wikipedia is a group of volunteers and they actually uh, have strict rules for people who come and work for, for money to, to change Wikipedia. And, and that's a, there's a good reason for it because nobody must use Wikipedia as, as a place neither for propaganda nor for advertisements. You can imagine that companies would like their companies to be presented in a favorable uh, light and, and hence they would edit themselves, uh, their articles about themselves and, and, and uh, use very positive uh, vocabulary about it. That's not allowed. You're not allowed to edit your own Wikipedia page, neither as a person or as a an organization. You, you, can, you can write the article about uh, uh, the University of Kiev and Ki the University in Kiev can uh, write the article about Karasin. So you, you're, you're not supposed to tout out your own horn. And, and that's a great, great uh, ethic. Uh, um, so, so those would be the, 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 the two categories that I already mentioned. But uh, if you are to correct lots of information, which is important and which is absolutely necessary for uh, Katerina, then you need people uh, who work full time on it. They need, they need uh, food on the table and they need to feed their families and somebody has to pay their salaries. 
And that is why we need the categories three and four, which would be in the number three, it's individuals or non-government organizations that finance uh, the, 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 the people doing the edits in, in the category one. So, so uh, we are uh, in, in that sense, talking to a number of individuals and also identifying NGOs that can support the financing. But item four, governments as such, I believe that there is a, a logic by which we can convince uh, the European Union or, or, or the, the country of Federal Republic of Germany or Finland or Sweden or any other country that it makes sense to use governmental funds for correcting this information. And the reason I think that is that, well, so many European countries have uh, spent uh, billions and billions of euros on military aid to Ukraine. And that's great. But what if we had spent that money, or not that much money, just a fraction of that money to educate ourselves and educate each other when things happened in Georgia 2008? And what if we had done that in 2014 to educate ourselves? Uh, then if we had done it properly in 2008, we would have understood by 2014 that this is not going to end well. People were happily thinking, well, for our small green men on the Crimea, well, it's none of my business. But if there had been a general awareness amongst the educated public about the history of Ukraine, about the suppression of facts, about the level of propaganda, then we might have reacted a bit stronger, a bit earlier, and avoided much of what has been much of what has been happening. And hence, I think this is a project of cultural defense. So cultural defense is, is an expression I'd like to use. It is a form of defense to arm your country and arm uh, Europe with facts. And that's one of the reasons that Finland over the years has been doing fairly well because the level of education has been such that during uh, World War II, we did not believe uh, Russian propaganda, not because we had Finnish propaganda to counter it. Yes, we had some of that as well, but basically we had general education, which made it very, very hard to, to brainwash uh, Finland. So hence, the uh, item four, I do think that it's in the general Western interest to uh, see to it that the uh, facts are, are presented in a proper way. So the people that, that are working right now with Katerina, that, that is uh, uh, these three people here. It's uh, myself. I happen to be here for the first time ever in my life in Ukraine. It's, it's not taken yesterday and my face isn't exactly that uh, to, to today any longer. This was in the year 2000 and I was on Maidan and I, I hadn't ever seen this symbol before. I, I didn't really know much, uh, but I, I thought it was a cool thing and I was, was happy um, uh, on, on, on Maidan in, in the year 2000. I, there was some kind of an event, nothing as important as a revolution, uh, but, but something and, and that I was there. And this is uh, uh, Lena Yefimenko, my wife, and uh, uh, she's studying culture and philosophy now at Karasin right now, at a distance here from, from Finland and until now, until yesterday from, from Uni. And then we have uh, Robert uh, Silene, who has been working with me for 10 years in, in various, various roles, also like myself, an engineer in IT and management, and uh, um, has been actively working with Frederica and, and Wikipedia since, since uh, 2019. So uh, what have we been doing specifically for Katerina? Uh, so um, this is uh, Robert's work. So we've used the existing experience from Frederica, which, which is based on, on not just knowing the data structures of Wikipedia and Wikidata and Wikimedia Commons and several languages, it's based on Python 
and our programming that harvests data, analyzes data, and does bulk changes in data. Uh, so we can, for instance, look at the number of times a page was being read, an article has been read, which is how we've identified the 100 most important articles. And uh, uh, we've now signed a collaboration agreement with you and uh, made data science analysis of the uh, uh, 100 top read Wikipedia articles. We, we first did, um, there, there, there was a basic study of 40,000 articles in nine languages. Uh, because that's what that's the, the the amount of articles that had the tag Ukraine uh, uh, in order to find the 100 top most one most read ones of those we of course had to look at the the reading statistics of the 40,000 languages we then created these colorful diagrams that you might see here uh, they are actually named well before uh, Katerina was started after a Ukrainian mathematician uh, uh, Voroni uh, who, who um, has, has created a way to visualize uh, information in, in, in two dimensions. So the bigger a square is or, or a rectangle is, the more reads it has. And, and that's the way how you can quickly identify the most important um, articles. And we've then also started with experts uh, and academics in, in Karasin to identify corrections I think it was the 2014 Orange Revolution. Uh, we shouldn't, somebody said that we should start with um, uh, looking at uh, the Zelensky article. I think that's, that's a very, very tough article to start with, not because he would be inherently uh, uh, controversial or anything, but uh, an article about the living human being is amongst the most difficult things to, to edit in, in Wikipedia, uh, in particular if it is a, a, a president. And uh, hence we started with something a bit more uh, distant in history, not, not as distant as Pasepa or Stepan Bandera or anything, but, but still uh, 2014. And, and we get all kinds of uh, analysis here in detail with uh, various languages and and, and we can order it in various forms and all of that. So you, we do get uh, statistics in detail for people to, to look at. So now uh, the process looking uh, onwards from, from now is to choose articles to improve. We have the top 100 list to read the article in the languages that you know, which is uh, likely for most of you, these three languages, Ukrainian, Russian, or English, but you can read, read it in any language with Google Translate, and that, that's already super helpful. And then it, the article needs to be improved to a good level in one language, and you can pick which one it is. Uh, you have to create the username. We can help you with all of that. Um, and uh, you can edit and publish one section of the article at the time. You need to earn a reputation, all of those things are, are stuff that we have lots of experience training people to become Wikipedians. And again here, underlining the need for references, citations. We, you cannot just write uh, stuff. You have to say what the source is. And the references don't absolutely have to be in the same language. It's just a benefit that, that the source is in the, in the, in the same language. And uh, oops. And, and then we need to encourage improvements in other languages. We are not able to master all of the important languages ourselves, but uh, things can spread between the languages because they are linked. So a good article in any language can then be used as a source for improvements in the other languages. And we have a project page here. It's not just published uh, in the overall space, it's in the so-called sandbox of, of uh, rollback here. So that's basically what I wanted to share with you right now. This was a lot of, lot of stuff. And now back, back to you. I'm, I'm open for any kinds of, of questions uh, and comments. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kai. I have been listening to, uh, um, I, I mean, uh, this material um, 
told by you several times, but every time I'm uh, even more interested. Uh, does anybody have any questions? You are very welcome. Okay, Daddy, you're welcome. Hello, I actually have uh, some discussion. Uh, there's actually a problem with uh, the Wikipedia page of Vasil Karazin, the founder of our university. In uh, Ukrainian Wikipedia, he is obviously listed as Ukrainian, as he was born in Ukraine. But in English Wikipedia, he's listed, uh, he's listed as Russian Enlightenment figure. And uh, all the other proper names, especially the names of Ukrainian cities, are written in Russian transliteration instead of Ukrainian in his page. And uh, as I figured, the creator of the page is Russian themselves. They keep undoing the changes, the changes done by many Ukrainians and saying that the provided facts are his historically inaccurate and just pushing our own narrative. So my question is, do you have any thoughts on what to do in this situation? Is there a way to solve this, to find some compromise? What, what to do? Yeah, so uh, very, very good question and a typical, typical uh, thing here. So um, I will answer, uh, I will answer your specific question and, uh, but I will, I will first, uh, explain a background thing that Robert and I uh, experienced in Swedish with people who are not really against Ukraine or pro-Russia at all, so that you understand that the setting here. So we were, uh, we were uh, looking at articles vaguely related to Ukraine. They were about uh, people, engineers in Finland, one of them uh, was the founder of the harbor of Mariupol, and the other one was head of uh, the Russian railways at the point in time when, in 1888, uh, there was an assassination attempt against Alexander III, uh, and that was 43 kilometers uh, outside of Kharkiv, uh, Borki or Birki or something. I, I've forgotten the place. And and based on that, there were place names again, like Borki, I think is the Russian version, and Birki, the, the, the Ukrainian. And uh, uh, we did some edits and somebody contacted us and said, hey, what about the, the place names in general in, uh, in Swedish? Why are you using the tra Russian transliteration for it? And we were thinking, yeah, why are we? Well, probably we shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, let's fix it. So we started fixing them. Uh, and and uh, one fix did not work, and that was the fix of, of Odessa. So Odessa has always been spelled with two S in, in, in Swedish. And uh, the correct Ukrainian transliteration of Odessa is Odessa, in, in Swedish, the transliteration into Swedish is Odessa with one S. And we changed it, and then it was quickly undone by somebody. But that was not by, by uh, some Russian imperialist. It was by somebody who said that, well, we've had this discussion half a year ago, and we, we spell Kiev, K-I-E-V, and we've done that in Swedish since time immemorial. And actually, the Swedish spelling of, of Kiev is not a Russian transliteration because the proper uh, Russian transliteration of Kiev would also be something different. And, and the end outcome there was uh, that from a transliteration perspective, uh, we have some established names of Ukrainian places uh, where uh, we are not using standard Ukrainian transliteration in Swedish. And that would be Kiev, it would be Krim, where, where it should be spelled K-R-Y-M, much like Katerina with a Y, but we're, we've always said Krim. And, and that's also wrong if you, uh, I think from a, from a Russian, Russian standpoint. So it's not like we would be using the Russian one. In Odessa, yes, we're using the Russian one with two S. And those would be the only four places which are known enough in Swedish to have a particular spelling. Uh, in the case of Kharkiv, Harkov, uh, the article was happily renamed from Harkov to Harkiv because um, for some reason Harkov is not that known as, as, as Odessa, Krim, or, or, or Kiev in, in Swedish. So there has been a cleaning up of uh, Ukrainian names, and lots of it was done by Robert, where we changed the spelling of Ukrainian place names 
from Russian Confederation to Ukraine. Now that was only part of your question. You said that you had a, a bit of an edit war. So uh, that's what uh, edit, edit war is what happens when one person you, uh, uh, makes a change and then the other person und uh, does an undo of it. And uh, there is a process in Wikipedia for how to handle these things because they are not uncommon, they're not unheard of. I think this, you think that. No, I'm right. No, you're right. No, blah, blah. And, and uh, that then is uh, escalated uh, within that language community and uh, in, uh, to somebody uh, if there's enough edits. And then uh, there, there will be a process where, where somebody says this person is right, the other person is, is wrong. And, and, and this is something that Robert can help you with how to, how to, to sort of make uh, Karasin uh, have proper spellings and, and, and being characterized as a, um, as a Ukrainian person, because you have a so-called discussion page where you can come with your argumentation. No, I think Karasin should be presented as Ukrainian because he was born there and there and he self-identified as a Ukrainian speaker, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and then you argue your case and based on that argument, somebody who doesn't know about Karasin will, will see who has the better argument and, and, and you could also point to a project page about general Russian uh, misinformation. I, I'm talking now about the uh, Katerina project. So, so that's a typical uh, information war that has sometimes to be, to, to be done because there are very, very opinionated people who, who will do exactly uh, the things that, that, that you were talking about. Yeah, thank you so much for answering. Thank you very much for the question, for the answer. Do you have any other questions? So, if no, then maybe we can uh, thank Kai once more. Thank you very much. And uh, again, uh, we ask everybody who is uh, interested in the process. Uh, to text Lena or to text me possibly um, in order to get maybe more details of uh, this project because we, we are really trying to develop this uh, project Katerina together with Kai's team. I mean we as uh, our university and we hope uh, we still hope that our collaboration will turn out to be fruitful. Yeah, so I'd like also uh, Robert to present himself shortly because Robert is the person who can help you with the practical questions like the one that Daria just 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 had, he, he sits in with lots and lots of detailed experience. And also to repeat now, what we'd like you to do is look at the project pages. Like if we get all of your email addresses, we can send you a bulk email about with with some of the core information that we've had. Then you can pick your favorite articles. You you we can assign articles, but but uh, it's always a benefit if you personally care about some article that you're going to work with first and do some edits and learn and just try and and we can organize together uh, with you or for you we can organize uh, events where we over Zoom explain exactly how to do the first step is to create a, a user ID so that you have a uh, user ID and password that can do some edits and do first just a correction of a spelling mistake, such as uh, changing a place name from, from uh, Russian to, to Ukrainian and get warm in your clothes before you, you do the really controversial things. But please, Robert, present yourself and, and, and uh, share, share, like show your, your screen. Hey, hi, hi there. Hey, hello. Yes, hi, I'm, I'm Robert. Uh... Thank you, Kai, and thank you, everybody, for uh, have turned up and listened to this. And uh, yes, indeed, if if you have similar questions to the one about Karazin and and would like to to start uh, working on these types of things, please please do contact us, and so we can get the the ball rolling on this project. It would be very good to see some some tangible results. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much to everybody, uh, to our speaker, speakers basically, and to our guests. Uh, again, we are, you are very welcome to take part if you wish, and maybe 
If no questions and uh, no other suggestions, we can finish for today. Thank you all, Han. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. And happy to work with you onwards from, from now on on this. Thanks. Thank you very much.